Good morning, and welcome to the Vineyard Church of God once again. We hope you had a blessed week um, and, a, and an uneventful week. Um, and, you know, nothing happened to you that uh, that is harmful or discouraging. Uh, if there is, we pray for you to have a happier week this week. As we come into the Lord's presence today, um, I just wanted to make sure that if you're watching the video, click the subscribe button on the bottom. Uh, if you have any comments, uh, prayer requests, any testimonies, write them down for us. We look at them, we pray over them. Um, if you don't want your prayer request to be known, uh, you can go to our website at thevineyardcog.com and go to the contact us page and write down your request in there. It goes to our email and we check it daily. Um, and we do pray for you. And we know that where Jesus, you know, where two or more are gathered, Jesus is in the midst of us and he hears us and God hears our prayers and he answers our prayers. Sometimes it'll be no, sometimes it's yes. You know, a lot of times it's yes. Um, but we know that he answers our prayers. He listens to us. Let's go ahead in, in prayer today. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come into your presence today, to be able to come into your house and praise and worship and glorify you freely today, Father God. We pray that your word comes out of my mouth, Father God, that it be your word that enters the hearts and the minds of those that are listening and not my words. We pray that, that you build up and you edify the, the people, Lord, that you bring them closer to you, that you give them joy and you give them peace, that you give them an understanding of your word to move closer to you and build up your kingdom, Father God. Not for us, it's for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And today we're going to be looking at um, about commitments. I know that's a, it's a tough word for a lot of people is to have a commitment and uh, it's even harder to understand what it means by a commitment, to make, an, make a commitment and to keep that commitment. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at Malachi chapter two, verses one through 16, straight through uh, at the reading of, of the Lord's word. Um, I, was, I was watching a, a video or you know, a transcript by uh, Pastor Rick Ezell okay and he inspired me on this and I, I said you know what we have got to talk about this because in this world there are a lot of people not holding their commitments um, and it's hurting them it's hurting other other people around them um, it's just like a chain reaction a domino effect when we don't do what we say we're going to do how does it affect ourselves our lives the lives of our family our businesses uh, friends um, and it does. Everything that we do is connected. And so starting out in Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, I'm going to read it all the way through. He says, And now, O priest, this commandment is for you, and if you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your, your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread re refuse on your faces and refuse on your solemn feast, and one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace, and I gave them to, gave them to him, that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from inequity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore I also have made you contemptible and base, be, er, and base before all the people, 
because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. Okay, and we go into where he's talking about treachery of infidelity. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tent of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering any more, nor receive it with good will from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring, therefore he takes heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, that you do not deal treacherously. Yes, he's talking about he's talking about marriage. He's talking about uh, the the commitments between a pastor and and the Lord God Almighty. But it's also something to do. We can take a lot of this and bring it into our own lives, the commitments that we have, that, that we made with the Lord, with other people, our family, our friends, our businesses. You know, we, we make commitments or promises all the time. We are going to be committed to, to reaching this goal, and then, you know, it, it's not there anymore. Okay? But my introduction on this thing comes from uh, Jack... Canfield, he's writing in the Success Principles. He says this, ask participant, he asked participants in his seminars to agree to a list of 15 ground rules. Number one, be on time, sit in a different chair every, every break, no alcoholic beverages until training is over, and others. He made a lot of them. So he makes them sign a form in their work, workbook that says, I agree to keep these guidelines and ground rules. Okay, they make a covenant with them right there when they sign that thing. On the morning of the third day, he asked everyone who, who has broken one of the ground rules to stand up. What becomes apparent, he writes, is how casually we give our Lord and then how casually we break it. We, we give our word and then we break our word. Okay, it, it's a spur of the moment thing. We get excited. You know, we think, oh, we can do this. You know, this is great. You know, there's nothing. And then, yet, we can't keep the agreement. We can't do it because we got to break one thing. You know, right? Okay, but when you break that contract, when you break the commitment, the agreement that you made, you broke it. Right? And you got to consider the consequences of what you just did. Cabot Robert, author and professional speaker, he writes, Character is the ability to carry out a good resolution long after the excitement of the moment has passed. Honoring your commitment is part of your character. It's a quality that attracts people to you and enhances your relationship and opportunities. Failing to honor your commitments will tarnish your image and have a negative effect on your reputation. It can create a barrier to personal achievement and erect a roadblock against success. By honoring your commitments, you create a strong foundation that will support you and your endeavors as well, or as a result, you will be recognized as a person of integrity and character. Someone other or someone others can trust. Werner uh, Ehart states, your life works to the degree you keep your agreements. Okay? It all depends. You know, can they trust you? Can people trust you? If you keep breaking your commitments, keep breaking your word, people lose trust in you. They lose faith in your abilities. 
in doing that, it breaks down your reputation in the family. Okay, your family name becomes tarnished. In your businesses, you can't be trusted in your businesses because you keep breaking your commitments. So it, it, it's like a domino effect. You know, one thing reacts to the other. It, it does have an effect. There is none of this, my, you know, uh, take voting. My vote doesn't count. Yes, it does. It has a chain reaction. If you do it and say, I did it, other people are going to say, oh, wow, you know, he did it. I can do it too. Boom, there's another one, you know, and so on down the line. It does make a difference. One man made a difference at the cross. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he changed time. You know, it, it just everything. It changed the world. One man made a difference. Honoring commitments impacts all dimensions of life. All dimensions. Let me ask, ask these questions. Do you honor commitments you make to your team? Do you honor them? If I make a promise to you, I've got to keep my promise to you. Right? So you sign the commitment coming back to me. So we're both on the same page. So do you honor your commitments you make to your team? to show up for them, even in tough and uncomfortable situations. This pandemic has come in and it's taken the church and, and cleaned it out. It's taken people out of the seats, put them in, in the chairs at home, you know, in the couches at the home and put them on the computers. You know, it, it's changed a lot of things, okay? But even in these tough or uncomfortable situations, are you still committed to the Lord? Are you still committed to the pastor, to the church? Are you still, you know, uh, supporting them, you know, in, in their events and what they do? Are you supporting them in your tithe, your giving? Are you, are you still being committed to that? Are you holding to your agreement that you have made with the Lord and to that church? Do you keep the promises you make to them? Do you honor commitments you make to yourself? There are promises that, that we make to ourselves. Do we keep them? You always hear about that resolution that, that we make at the, the beginning of the year, the end of the year, whichever one it is, a New Year's. And how many of us really keep and honor our commitment, our resolution? Do you do that? Do you honor the commitments you've made to God? Okay, I promise, Lord, I'm going to be there for that. Uh, I'm going to be there. I'm going to do this. You know, you've given me the ability to do this, so I'm going to use my talent that, that you've given me, and I'm going to be there for that. And the event comes along, and no one's to be seen. Okay, are you going to keep your commitment? The people of Judah with the priests leading the way had failed to keep the covenant agreement with God, the agreement they made with God. Okay, that's one agreement that you don't want to go back on is agreements made with God. They treated God with disrespect, dishonoring them. They treated sacred things as common, as common. You know, your, your pan, your pots and pans, common things that, that we use every day. Okay, they treated them just like that. You know, as your garbage can, you use it every day, you know dishonoring God. They turned away from God's law, disobeying the commandments. With the most appalling display of dishonor, some men divorced their Jewish wives, breaking their vows to marry pagan women. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, with interracial marriages, you know, different cultures, things like that. They're not talking about that. There's nothing race about it. But what it is about is that these Jewish people made a promise to God that they were going to keep his word, that they were going to keep him throughout their bloodline. But these Jewish people were divorcing their godly women for women who served other gods, okay, which tainted the bloodline. Okay, so that's what they did. They broke that commitment to God for keeping a godly people into divorcing, number one, they broke the commitment with the wife in front of God, 
And they went to another wife, brought her in, who is, is, is a pagan God lover. Okay? And that, that is totally just, it, it's wrong. It's appalling. Malachi provided a, provided a stern rebuke, though. He presented several reasons why the Jewish people were to honor their commitments. And the thing is that we should follow suit. We should follow what Malachi has to teach us, to tell us. Okay, that's why we have God's word to be able to fall back on and look and say, well, you know, they did it this way and it worked. Okay, so if it works, use it because it'll work for you too. Okay, number one, we have the responsibility, which is a response or responding in obedience. God desires for us to listen and obey. If you, if you do not listen, and if you do not take it to heart to honor my name, in Malachi 2, verse 2, it says that it's one thing to believe something is true. It's another thing to obey it. Now, James reminds us in James 1, verse 22, and this is one of my favorite ones. It's a favorite one. I always wondered why this thing just caught my eye. Is because it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You hear the word, you do it. And you hear the word from God, you do it. God doesn't ask us to do anything. God commands us. It, it's a command. Whenever he speaks and says something, it's a command. It's not, well, if you feel like it when you get up in the morning, can you do this? No. He says, do it. Do this. And we're supposed to do it. Another great model is young Samuel. Remember Samuel, after hearing God's voice in the middle of the night on three different occasions in 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 3, verse 10, God called his name. He said, Samuel, or, and Samuel responded when God called his name, speak for your servant is listening. That's what Samuel said. Speak for your servant is listening. I'm listening to you. Okay, and then God would talk. Okay, you got my attention, and I'm listening to you. What do you want me to do? Okay, Samuel did that three times. Can you say that now when God speaks to you? Can you say, I'm listening. I'm listening. Go ahead and speak. Can we say that now? Are you listening to God? Are you obeying God's instructions? He tells you what to do. Are you doing them? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Are you honoring your commitments to him? Yes, Lord, you know, it's the middle of the night. Yes, Lord, I'll, I'll do it. I'm going to do it. And then you fall asleep and you don't do it because you, you use the excuse, well, I was tired and, and I just fell asleep and forgot. No, when that happens, get up and do it. The litmus test of obedience is whether or not you are living what you know to be true. Are you living a Christian life? If you know God's word to be true, are you living it? If you have a truth in your life, a goal that you are going towards, do you believe that goal? Do you believe what's at the end of this race? If so, okay, keep the commandments. Keep, keep your commitment going. I'm committed to reaching the end of the race to that goal, and I'm going to do it. Right? you got to do it. Don't give up. Malachi provides the details. Um, here it is. Number one, uh, revere God in verse 5. Stand in awe of God. Stand in awe of Him. Okay? A lot of people have grown complacent to God and God's miracles uh, and when he speaks to us, when we know that it's him talking, you know, we get, still got to have that, yes, the awe, this is God talking to me, okay? Not, huh, it's just God talking to me. No, be in awe of God, okay? How many people can truly say, I heard from the Lord, okay? This is a message from the Lord for me, okay? When you do that, we got to stand in awe of God. We live with a high view and enormous respect for God's holiness. Many of us, if we are honest with ourselves, play games with God. We play games, okay? We compromise. Mm. Disobeying whenever we feel like it, revering our awesome God inspires obedience. When we give him reverence, this is God talking, God 
deserves the respect and reverence that you know he, he created you he created everything he created everything in the heavens all right he's an awesome god we need to give him reverence number two receive truth in verse six where malachi is speaking in verse six accept god's instructions maintain a steady intake of the bible god's word should penetrate our lives like a stake driven deep into the ground a failure to teach and receive the truth from God's word sets a stage for wrong doctrine and shabby living. The crisis in many denominations demonstrates this, that their leaders could, ap could approve homosexual clergy is due to years and years of failing to teach and apply the scriptures. There is no compromise in God's word. God's word is written down for a reason. It is permanent. Nothing can be changed. And it says that in scriptures. You will not change one word, one meaning. You can't. This is God's word and it holds true yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. It's the same thing. We can't candy coat scripture. We can't change it to say what we want it to say. Sin is sin. Hell is real, okay? What we do behind the pulpit, what we do when we, resent, or when we represent Jesus in going out and teaching people about Jesus, about God's word, we are representatives of Christ. We are the ones saying, this is what Jesus says, okay? This is what God's word says, and here it is. Okay, proof. God's word says this, and you can't change it. Okay, we're responsible for that. And if we go around saying, it's okay, it's okay in your case, right? So we're going to change it and it will make you feel good because that's what we do is we're here to make you feel good and send you home so you can be happy and come back to church again the next week and, and, and give us your money, okay? And we'll make you feel good again and send you home. No, it's not what it's about. God's word is made to be true, and it's to go out and tell people, this is God's word. It's what it says, and there's no getting around it. Okay? That's what we need to do. And the thing is, when it talks about maintaining a steady intake of, of the Bible, God's word, make sure you're looking at the right Bible. Because there are Bibles out there that are popular Bibles that take out complete paragraphs of God's word and sometimes taking out God itself in the verse. And we got to watch out for that. This is God's word meant to be taken in God's way. Number three, we've got righteous living in verse six. Walk in a manner that is good and upright, turning away from sin. We got to show people this is godly living. This is what a Christian is like. You know, hey, we're nothing superior to anybody. We're not putting our noses higher than anybody else. We're at the same level, except we have Jesus and we're showing you this is how we live. This is Jesus. This is the right way. This is the way God intended people to live. Right? So walk in a manner that is good and upright. Turn away from sin. Number four, represent God to others. In verse seven, the Levitical priest represented God and revealed his will to the people. We as a kingdom of priests in the world today bear that same responsibility. We are God's messengers to a lost world. We guide people into the uncompromised truth. This is God's truth, not compromise. And that's what we're bringing people into. Show them the truth, what's real. Okay, these four commitments we should make on a daily basis is this. Honor God, drink from his word, live distinctly, or yeah, distinctly as God's people, and to be his messengers in the world. Those are the four things we need to be committed to. All right? Warning is number five. Or this is number two in the section, okay? Warning, recognize the downside. We got to recognize, okay, this could happen. 
this is going to be what's going to happen if I react in a certain way to God's word. Okay, Malachi does not sugarcoat the situation. He's not compromising. God goes right for the jugular. He reminds his hearers that if they fail to keep their commitments, God will curse them. Plain and simple. You sin. You know, what is sin? Sin means death to God. Okay? Which means you get rid of him. There is no God. I turned my back on you. Right? Well, okay. And if you don't take it to heart to honor my name, says Yahweh of hosts, I will send a curse among you, and I will curse your blessing. In fact, I've already begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. That's in Malachi, you know, the second verse. The heart is command is the command center of a person's life, where we collect and consider knowledge, where we make decisions and plan and plans that determine the direction of our lives. We are to or we are determined to honor our commitments, to keep our promises. We have to keep our promises. That's who we are. We have to do this. There's no way that I can go against God's word because I know in my heart that I have to keep his commandments. Okay? This is a promise. I made it. I made it when I became a pastor. I made that promise. This word here, I have to uphold. God's word. All right? He goes right for the juggler, though. He tells you what he's going to do. The heart, the command center. We are to make decisions and plans that determine the direction of our lives. Here we determine to honor our commitments to keep our promises. The warning is clear. It's warning. He warns them right away. You are going to be cursed. How many of us want to live a cursed life? How many of us want our families to be cursed? Who want our businesses to be cursed? Who want our lives, total lives, to be cursed? our friends to be cursed. Who wants that? Nobody wants that. Failing to honor your commitments will damage your personal testimony, impact your success in life, and strain your relationship with God. Watch your commitments. Number three, we have the reason. This is our reason for it. Remember the benefits. Remember them. Malachi provided several spiritual benefits to honoring commitments with God. He wrote, My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave these to him. It called for reverence, and he, re he revered me and stood in awe of my name. In Malachi 2, verses, you know, verse 5. He said, Life and peace was the Lord's covenant promise. Life and peace. He wants us to have life and peace. I promise you people life and peace if you follow my commandments. Okay? If you keep your commitment with me. Life speaks of a qualitative or qualitative okay, these long words satisfying life known only to those who are recipients of God's favor. Peace is more than a quiet soul but also welfare of every kind. Remember I preached about perfect peace. We can obtain a perfect peace, which is peace in everything. You know, when you usually think about that, you think of peace and harmony. Okay, there is a way to obtain pure peace or perfect peace, and that's through God's word. That is through keeping your commitment with the Father. When a person honors their commitment, they reach out into an unprecedented future and make one thing predictable. Let's see, it's it. No, it's like this. Okay, let me read that again because I'm getting confused here. My tongue's getting tied. Okay, excuse me. Ah, that's better. When a person honors their commitments, they reach out into an unpredictable future. We can't predict what's going to happen. And make one thing predictable. They will be there. They will follow through. They will be true to their word. 
With one simple commitment, a person creates an island of uncertain, or certainty in a sea of uncertainty. When you honor your commitments, you take a hand in creating your own future. And that is a good thing, a healthy thing, if we keep our commitments, our promises that we make to people. And say, we are going to do this, we are going to be there. You know, I'm going to hold fast no matter what. I'm going to keep my commitments. Number four is failure, resorting to unfaithfulness. The priest failed in their responsibility to teach the gospel or to teach the people of God's law, you know, the, the gospel. The people turn in or people in turn failed to revere God, received his word, and lived distinctly from their non-believing neighbors. The result was their disregard for God's standard concerning marriage. Five times in this passage, Malachi used the word faithless. Some translations use the phrase breaking faith or deal treacherously. Simply speaking, they did not honor their commitments. They failed to keep their promises and they broke their vows. They divorced their Christian wives, their Jewish Christian wives, and they remarried into paganism. Okay? They broke their vow. Right? You can't do that because there's a consequence in breaking your vow, especially when it comes to God, your commitment. The word faithless has the idea of pillaging something intended to remain protected and is tied very closely to another word that is used in this section, covenant, in verses 10 and 14. A covenant was a solemn and binding mutual agreement between two parties. When one party failed to fulfill this his con convent, or covenantal obligation, the covenant was said to be broken in that the other party was no longer obligated to fulfill his obligations. The Jews had broken that agreement and God no longer had to fulfill his side of the obligation. When you break a commitment with God, God is no longer in a binding contract with you. So he can back out of his blessings. He can take them away. What you worked so hard for, you were going, you were really being committed, and you broke the contract. You lost the blessing. And what did it say back in the other part of this? You're to be cursed. The Jewish men had violated the covenant agreement with their wives, in verse 10. They had failed to keep the commitment to their spouses, but this was only a repercussion of the larger issue that's, that was stated in verse 8, where it says, You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. You violated it. You just went the wrong way. All right? Instead of sticking to it, you gave up. You went the other way. You gave in to the world. The word corrupted means to damage something as to render it useless. And for those that are listening that, that have computers in a computer-generated world, it would be like this. Your computer has now become corrupt. It is useless. The only way to get that computer back up and running again is to clean the problem, to clear it out, to start new, to create new over. And the only way that we can do that in our life is to bring God back into our lives, is to respect God, revere Him, and commit to Him and keep that commitment. With the computer, you have to reboot the whole thing back to its original. Start over again. This time, keep the clean stuff in there and keep the dirty stuff out that corrupts it. Many a marriage, friendships, or businesses, business partners have been rendered useless because one person's failed to honor a commitment. Number five, this is the last one in five, action, action. You know, the Word of God is not something that we just sit there. It, it's not stagnant. It's an action. It's something that we do. Okay? Malachi 
Okay, action, erecting boundaries is the other part of this verse. Malachi provided some needed action steps. So watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously against the wife of your youth. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously in Malachi chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. The word watch means to hedge with thorns or to protect by attending to. Okay, build that hedge of protection around it. Okay, he was speaking to marriage saying there are some things we can do to promote and protect our marriages but the principles apply to all our com our commitments. It applies to everything that we commit to, all these things. It's applied to marriage in Malachi, but then again, God's word can be put everywhere in every part of our life and every aspects of our lives. Here are a few boundaries to consider erecting to protect the commitments you make. Alone, I am responsible for my life. I will stop blaming, rationalizing, and ex excusing my failure to honor my commitment. It is the responsibility of the individual who, to take up the responsibility. Stop putting the blame on somebody else or something else. You're the one that's making the commitment. You're the one that's got to keep the commitment, not anybody else. That's you. have some excuses here. I can't do everything, so it's okay to say no. I will speak with purpose. I will only make commitments I intend to keep. Okay, think before you act. Don't live in the excitement of the moment. Don't say, yes, yeah, I can do all those. And then not, okay? Try this, I will write down all the agreements I make. Write them down. If you make a commitment, if you make an agreement, write it down so you don't forget. You can always come back to it. I will clear up any broken agreement at the first opportunity. If you break the agreement, clear it up. I am so sorry. You know, I, I, I was supposed to do this and I didn't do this. It's my fault. How can I clear it up? Okay? Talk to people. Lastly, I will follow through on the commitments I have made, even though it may require sacrifice, work, and cost. If you make the commitment, you got to take up the responsibility to fulfill that commitment. Don't leave it to someone else. In conclusion, we have a God who honors his commitments. He keeps his promises. He fulfills his word. When you choose not to quit, when the going gets rough, Stick to lost causes because you said you would. Hold on to the love grown cold. Stay with people you have become, or who have become pains in the neck. Okay, we got those people. They become pains in the neck. I don't want to be around them. But you got to stick with them. Stick with your commitments. Then you are most like God. When you can do that, you are most like God. Amen? That's the way it works. I have a little thing here out of a book that's called A Promise Kept. It's a story of Robertson McCulkin. McCulkin? It has a Q, so I hope I'm saying it right. He's a former missionary and seminary president who gave up his post because his wife Muriel had Alzheimer's disease. He dedicated himself full time for as long as the Lord deemed necessary to, keep, to take care of his wife. He wrote of traveling with her. And he says this, once our flight was delayed in Atlanta and we had to wait a couple of hours. Now that's a challenge. Every few minutes we take a fast paced walk down the terminal in earnest search of what? Muriel had always been a speed walker. I had to jog to keep up with her. An attractive woman, executive type, sat across from us working diligently on her computer. Once we returned from an excursion, she said something without looking up from her papers. Since no one else was nearby, I assumed that she had spoken to me, or at least mumbled in protest for our constant activity. Pardon? I asked. Oh, she said. I was just asking myself, will I ever find a man to love me like that? McKilkin turned to the woman and said, oh yes, you can find a man like that. You can find a man like that because I found a man like that. 
The only reason I love my wife the way you see me loving her is because the man Jesus first loved me. The only resources I have to draw upon to love my wife the way I do are the resources he gives me. Mirrored in my relationship here with my wife, you can see the faithful love of God for me. See, when we honor our good commitments, we're more like Jesus. Keep your commitments. When we take our vows, it's to death do us part. When we make our vows to God, it's the same way. Jesus calls us the bride, and he's the bridegroom. We made a commitment till death do us part. Right? So don't part away from Jesus. It's not dead. Matter of fact, when we die from this earth, when we leave this earth, this is just a stopping point. Then we enter into eternity, an eternal relationship with Jesus, an eternal commitment to God. And it's a far better place. And you won't want to leave what God has in store. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you for your word today. And we pray that it enters people's minds and their hearts. Not just to keep to themselves, but to share with those that they, they meet, that they know, Father God. Even sharing on Facebook the messages that, that are sent out. Share your word to bring joy and hope in their lives. To keep your word, your full word, Father God, your good word in their lives to share with others also to increase your kingdom father god and to bring joy in people's lives and give them hope give them the knowledge of you father god and knowing that you have your word written down and it is the same yesterday today and tomorrow and forever that it will never change this is something that we can hold on to and know that you will never take it away from us that's your promise, Father God, that we have a place with you when we leave this earth. As long as we hold on to our commitments, give us strength in every day. We ask this in Jesus' name, that you watch over us as we head out into the missions field today. That you put a hedge of protection around us, our properties, our vehicles, our businesses, our houses, everything and everybody that we come in contact with father god that the devil will not come against us for if you're you're before us who could be against us no one it's your protection it's your strong fortress that holds the enemy back we pray this in jesus name amen amen, amen. and we'll see you next sunday